Looking ahead. Challenges and opportunities in the changing world. Welcome to Talking Economics, a podcast by the Center for Economic Research and Graduate Education, Economics Institute. Empires, nation states and democracies. Perspectives on the war in Ukraine. Is what we will discuss today with our special guest, Professor Gerard Rolan. Professor Roland is a member of the Executive and Supervisory Committee of Sergi I, an E. Morris Cox Professor of Economics and Professor of Political Science at the University of California at Berkeley. His early work includes political economy of communism. After 1990, he became one of the world's most renowned and influential scholars in transition economics. We are proud to have him as our guest today. Welcome, Professor Roland. Thank you very much. Well, Without further ado, I would jump right into the topic that we advertise. In one of your recent papers or your recent work, uh, you look at the coexistence and interactions between empires, nation states and democracies. Um, it is very uh, relevant perspective that could help us understand what's happening in Ukraine. So please tell us more. So, um, uh, essentially, um, this is trying to give a framework for the um, international relations situation uh, currently. So, for most of history, uh, international relations was really about the rivalry between empires. And, you know, be it uh, uh, empires, you know, Persian Empire, the Egyptian Empire, you know, the Ottoman Empire, there, there's, there's certainly a lot of examples in history. But uh, uh, empires started collapsing uh, after World War I. After World War I, we saw the collapse of the Ottoman Empire, the Austro-Hungarian Empire, uh, the German Empire, the Russian Empire. And uh, uh, after uh, World War II, there was the collapse of the colonial empires uh, with decolonization. You know, the uh, Britain stopped being an imperial power, uh, started be becoming a you know, second, second rate power, etc. So, so um, uh, with the decline of empires, uh, there has been uh, two kind of uh, systems that emerged. One is nation states, uh, which was actually pushed by Woodrow Wilson after World War I, uh, and the other is uh, democracies. So the reason I'm talking about this is that to understand today's situation, you still have some empires, you have nation states and you have democracies, mm -hmm and they behave in a, a different way. So uh, first about empires, this yes. is very important. Mm -hmm. Empires typically have a natural tendency towards expansion because empires uh, uh, typically are autocratic systems, uh, uh, whether it's an emperor or a president or a dictator who's at the head, essentially uh, they have in mind, um, you know, the expansion of territory because expansion of territory uh, uh, gives land, gives resources, uh, uh, gave slaves, gave uh, you know mm -hmm. free labor, and uh, so so for as I said, for a very long time, international relations was really dominated by rivalries between empires, and then it was all about uh, uh, you know which empire would defeat which empire, uh, uh, and it was all about uh, 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 power relations, and so so. Uh, this was a situation where, where essentially international relations was covered by war, power relations, and mm -hmm. and 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 that 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 was it. Uh, nation states are very different uh, because uh, behind the notion of nation state is the idea to try to have uh, on a given territory uh, to have a, a ethnically homogeneous group. So. Uh, uh, nation states, in a way, are less expansionist than than empires, uh, because what they want is that they want to uh, recover territory where there are, uh, uh, you know, uh, ethnically people from the same ethnic group. Mm -hmm. They also want to repress people from different ethnic groups within their boundaries, and their uh, 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 ideology is is very nationalist. Is very nationalist, whereas empires typically their ideology is more universalist. It's based on you know universalist religions, mm -hmm. uh, uh, like you know whether it's the Orthodox religion, Islam, Confucianism, Catholicism, etc., uh, uh, etc. Cetera, et mm -hmm. cetera. Typical example I think of a nation state would be today's Hungary. Hungary under Orbán. Uh, is not really a democracy anymore. 
and it's trying to be uh, like a nation state in the sense that it wants to repress uh, ethnic minorities inside Hungary, but it also wants to uh, uh, access territories beyond Hungary where there are uh, uh, Hungarian, I'm Slovak, so. <laughs> uh, yeah, where there are you know Hungarians, yes. and that Slovakia and Transylvania mm. would certainly be uh, good examples. And then you have democracies. Uh, uh, democracies are very different. Democracies uh, um, are, uh, uh, as you know, as we know, are, are uh, systems with free elections. You know, rule of law, mm -hmm. human rights, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And uh, in democracies, uh, um, the the uh, polity is not based on uh, uh, you know any ethnicity or ethnic identity. It's based on the notion of citizenship. And so the notion of citizenship has nothing to do with you know ethnic uh, um, you know with your ethnic identity. The origin of this. Uh, uh, was the the Roman already this Roman mm -hmm. uh, uh, idea of citizenship, where uh, Rome was actually an empire, but then people could be citizens of Rome, which which was seen a little bit as a privilege, just like being citizen of Athens was a privilege for mm -hmm. free people uh, uh, inside uh, uh, inside Athens. And so, and uh, uh, one thing I want to say about democracies is that democracies tend not to be expansionist. On the contrary, democracies tend to be secessionist, that you see uh, once countries become democratic, uh, then sometimes they tend to split. I mean, Czechoslovakia, yes, when it became democratic, example. split, mm -hmm. you know, and, and that's, that's a, it's a, a, an example of a split that was done peacefully, whether people agreed or not, but, but you know, it was not done within the war, but you have secessionist tendencies in Belgium, that's where I come from, uh, uh, but also in Spain, Catalonia, Scotland, uh, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And so uh, uh, in today's world, we have the coexistence of empires, nation states, and democracies. Uh, this is a situation that is inherently very unstable. Uh, um, to come now to the situation in Ukraine, uh, Russia uh, uh, and certainly Putin see the world as a world of empires. So Putin's worldview is that of the 19th century, where the world was only composed of empires. And in that situation, it is completely legitimate for an empire to expand its territory, mm -hmm. uh, uh, to have buffer states, uh, to uh, engage in power relations uh, with other countries, to terrorize uh, populations that are being invaded. For, for him, this, this is how the world works. Those are the rules of the game. And all the rest is is hypocrisy. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, at the same time, uh, Ukraine um, uh, uh, has shown, at least since 2014, but already before, uh, the will of the population to become a genuine democracy uh, uh, and to become part of the European Union. And so this is a worldview that completely clashes with Putin's imperialist, Tsarist worldview. And for him, it represents a danger because this this democratic worldview uh, has actually uh, uh, not only become, I would say, dominant in Ukraine. It's clearly dominant in Ukraine. People are dying to defend democracy and independence. But also in Belarus, uh, the stolen election uh, from two years ago. Uh, mm -hmm. Clearly, you know, Lukashenko was not re-elected. Uh, uh, and so those were fake elections. And so uh, the situation is brewing in Belarus, but also in, in Russia, where in big cities in between 2011, 2013, people were very opposed to Putin. So, so democracy is seen as a uh, 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 as as a danger uh, uh, for him. At the same time, Ukraine is also seen as a colony uh, that has always been colonized by the Ru not always that has been colonized by the Russians for several hundreds of years, and so for them, it's completely natural uh, to recover their colony. So the threat is not only that it doesn't allow. Uh, Putin to expand the territory for which he thinks he has the right, but also that it could uh, cause problems within Russia, so that the territory that he already has can further break. The, the main, the main danger for Putin is just for losing power. Mm. But uh, it is true that if Russia uh, uh, loses power, 
uh, there would be um, probably secessionist tendencies within Russia. Whether or not Russia becomes a democracy, I think if Russia becomes a democracy, there will be there will certainly be tendencies towards secession because it's an empire. You know, the Russian Empire is very young. It started at around 1500. Uh, you know, the grandfather of Ivan the Terrible, that's the mm. origin of Tsarist Russia. And in a few hundred years, they colonized so much territory to the east, to the west. They took over uh, many territories from the Ottoman Empire, from, from Poland, uh, mm. uh, uh, etc. Uh, and so it's it's very likely, you know, if they lose the war, that there will be secessionist tendencies within Russia. Uh, um, but, but you know, if Russia becomes democratic, uh, certainly we would see the same tendencies because it's an empire. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But uh, what I meant to say was that um, you were saying that democracies are more uh, sectionist uh, rather than expansionary. Yes. Expansionary. So it wouldn't pose a threat for Putin in any other way, right? They're minding their own business, uh, trying to develop democracy within their own boundaries but uh, the threats are of different different nature mm -hmm. yes yes no no that's that's uh, uh, so so because the, the, you see the nature of democracy uh, in, in a way the the you know people in the european union are always surprised they say wow how come ukrainians are dying to become members of the european union because they don't realize that what they have is is quite fundamental that they have freedom uh, uh, freedom of expression, freedom of uh, organization, freedom of travel—you uh, uh, know—you uh, you know that that they have all these these major freedoms, and and the Ukrainians want that. They they consider that it can make them uh, prosperous, and Putin doesn't want that to happen, uh, uh, and certainly he's afraid of uh, uh, what could happen if there would be a strong democratic movement inside Russia, which he's been trying to crush for many years. At the beginning, you were saying that empires are something that is uh, kind of becoming extinct. Mm -hmm. How come that we still do have few empires? And what are the causes for the empires to to cease to exist? Or uh, I, this is this is a very good question. I think I think. Uh, uh, I would first state it slightly differently. Why I, our empire is in decline? Mm -hmm. I think that that's the first mm. thing, uh, 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 and and then I think you know once I answer that question, you 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 know I can come back to to, to your question why they still exist. So uh, why empires are in decline? Uh, this is because for a, a very long time in history, the main sources of uh, wealth or of income or of prosperity were land and slaves. Mm -hmm. Okay, so land and slaves, and by conquering more land, uh, you could have um, you know a more uh, output and more slaves. It's it's very interesting that uh, Hitler, in the twentieth century, uh, still had that ideology. He not only killed six million Jews, but he killed millions and millions of Slavs in Ukraine, Seasoned. Poland, Russia. Yeah. Uh, because he wanted to create a Lebensraum to give to to kill the Slavs and give land to the Germans. This is very feudal way mm. of thinking, but that's the thinking of empires. Okay. Uh, now, uh, what has changed in today's world? The main source of uh, growth is not land or slaves. Certainly not. It's human capital. Mm -hmm. And human capital is something uh, that is inside people's heads. And you cannot uh, uh, take people prisoners and force them to be productive using their human capital. That area is over. So, so for human capital to prosper, you actually need freedom. So, so, so in a way, uh, 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 democracy is much more appropriate as a uh, as a regime in which the main source of growth is is human capital. So this is the reason why empires are on the decline. Now, why do they still exist? I think we're in a transition period. I think mm -hmm. we are in a transition period. Uh, uh, so uh, uh, democracies were imperialist also at a moment, at a time. Uh, the UK uh, became democratic before the decolonization. So mm -hmm. for a while, the UK was, was both an empire and a democracy. Uh, the U.S. behaved like an imperialist power uh, during the Cold War. So, so even though it's also uh, a democracy, but but the 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 elements of democracy are there in the U.S. So the the isolationism that you see in the in the population, 
uh, is is clearly related to the fact that it's, it's a democracy, and this this has political. Uh, uh, effect when Biden uh, went out of Afghanistan in a chaotic way, as everybody knows, uh, uh, people in the elite were quite uh, scandalized by it, but not ordinary people, because ordinary people certainly did not want Americans to uh, continue dying in Afghanistan for what? You know, it's uh, 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 not clear. So, so I think indeed empires uh, are on the decline. Uh, Russia. Uh, uh, even though it's still militarily quite strong, but but you know its strength is shown to be very relative, as we see in Ukraine, because they're losing the war in Ukraine. But the, uh, Russia, as an economic power, uh, uh, is a dwarf. Uh, it has mm -hmm. huge territory, but but economically, it has a GDP that is lower than that of Italy, for example. So so just to give you uh, an example, or even Benelux. So so economically, it's very weak. Demographically. Uh, it's completely in decline. And then the other big empire that we have is China. China uh, is an empire. It's It has much more state capacity than Russia. Uh, it's militarily not as strong, at least on paper, uh, um, even though there's probably less corruption in the Chinese army compared to, to Russia. But uh, it's still uh, an empire because, just to give you uh, uh, an idea, if you uh, take China and you divide it into 50% uh, uh, to the east, 50% to the west, if you draw a line from, let's say, you know, Yunnan province to uh, Heilongjiang province uh, to the east, you have 93% of the population. And to the west, the western 50% has 7% of the population. Mm -hmm. And that is mostly national minorities like Tibet, Xinjiang, Inner Mongolia, uh, mm. uh, Qinghai, Ningxia, uh, parts of Yunnan, those are uh, mostly national minorities. Uh, uh, and so it's, it's in a way, it's a bit similar to what you have in the Russian Federation, uh, where uh, certainly, you know, uh, uh, in the Urals, but also in, in other areas, uh, uh, you have uh, um, uh, uh, national minorities uh, that are not feeling happy within within the Russian Federation, and and same thing, you know, uh, Tibet never accepted uh, being invaded by China in uh, 1951. Uh, they are still not accepting it. Uh, Xinjiang, uh, in a way, was not important to China, so they let they let it kind of uh, uh, aside. Uh, but Xinjiang became the hub of the Belt and Road Initiative. And so the new Silk Road goes through Xinjiang. Mm -hmm. And so there the Chinese thought they have to control it, which is why they put so many people in concentration camps, which is why they started with sterilization campaigns, etc., etc. So there is strong nationalism uh, aspect to these regimes as well you're saying or yes that, yes I... that's that's uh, that's right uh, in a way what is troubling uh, is that if you look at china uh, china is both an imperialist power uh, but it's also very nationalist mm -hmm. and this reminds me a little bit of the third reich hitler uh, that behaved both like an empire and tried to behave like a nation state. So it wanted to uh, uh, take a lot of land, but at the same time to have a, a, a German 100%, you know, ethnic presence in, in that empire, which of course meant, uh, um, uh, you know, genocidal activities towards, towards uh, other nations. I, I'm not saying that China is doing a genocide in Xinjiang, so that there are several people uh, saying that, but it is clear uh, uh, that they are trying to solve, quote unquote, solve the problem by uh, reducing the population sterilization policies mm. and by sending more and more Han to go there. But, you know, who wants to go live there <laughs> among the Han? So it's not, it's not that obvious. It's like, you know, who wanted to go in India uh, during the British Empire, they would not send the most competent people. Uh, and so, so you know, managing a colony, even if it's within your own territory, is not that easy. It could be even in smaller scale, right? The Czech Republic and, and the, the borders uh, when after the war, right? Like removing the Germans, replacing them with Czechs it was also a lot yes, of yes, yes, movement. Yes. Uh, going back to Russia, um, uh, I want to ask, you're, you were right uh, in the middle of, of, of the happenings, I would say, uh, during the transition, right after the fall of communism. Mm -hmm. And many of the countries that were under uh, the 
you know, part of the Russian Empire in a way, became democracies. Mm -hmm. uh, how come this change didn't uh, happen in Russia? Like, what was missing or what were different institutions, different, like, culture? What what prevented the Russia from, you know, taking a different trajectory? So, so first of all, um, coming to countries that were colonized by, you know, under the Soviet Union, uh, 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 those opposed to it uh, were not only Democrats and liberals, also nationalists. Mm. So some people wanted to uh, uh, chase the, the Soviets so that they could have a liberal market democracy within their country, but others because they wanted the nation state. And so you see the current government in Poland, you know, Orban in Hungary, they really want a nation state. So, so their attitude towards, you know, minority ethnic group is not as tolerant, they're more authoritarian, etc. Uh, when it comes to Russia, um, you know, it was chaotic. So, so Russia never really was democratic. That's to start with, if you have no experience of democracy, it's, it's more fragile once you start it. And uh, I would say uh, Yeltsin, uh, uh, in a way, was uh, committed to democracy. He was an authoritarian personality, but he was committed to democracy. When the republics uh, 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 declared independence, he, he let them go. Mm. But he didn't uh, accept uh, independence within the Russian Federation. So when Chechnya said, oh, uh, you know, Georgia is becoming independent, Armenia is becoming independent, so, so we also mm. want to become independent. They said, no, 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 not within the Russian Federation. But even then, he was quite, you know, weak. It's only when Putin came to power that he crushed Grozny, uh, 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 that that he showed clearly uh, that they would not uh, accept it. You know, there's several elements. One is that uh, the the uh, uh, culture and values change. Uh, so the EBRD did some research many years ago, showing that in former uh, uh, communist countries, uh, people uh, have more authoritarian values. Uh, and it's interesting because it was it was the divide was not between you know Central and Eastern Europe, actually a, a lot of Central Europe, including Hungary at the time, people had authoritarian values. So so uh, that's something that that certainly plays a role. Uh, the other thing is that you know if you look at Russia, it's a very heterogeneous country. Uh, you have some big cities. Uh, St. Petersburg, Moscow, you know, Yekaterinburg, you know, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, uh, and they are relatively prosperous, but then you have uh, uh, a hinterland, you know, that is extremely poor, uh, where uh, people uh, live in such poor conditions uh, that uh, we've seen this with the uh, soldiers from national minorities. Uh, uh, being actually the majority of th those who mm -hmm. went to Ukraine, but stealing, you know, refrigerators, washing machines, you know, uh, mm -hmm. saying, hey, they have indoor water. Et so so the, the, the level of poverty in most of Russian hinterland is, is extremely high, very low literacy level. So, so uh, uh, it's very difficult to, to manage a big country like that with a democratic system. The only way to do it is to have very strong decentralization and possibly even allowing some uh, uh, territories to become independent, which which they would not allow, given the given the imperialist mindset that they that they have. So that would be my answer. You, you also have to see that. Uh, uh, when the transition started, the only countries that remained democratic were those that entered the European Union. Uh, so in a way, uh, Ukraine is a little bit of uh, an outlier there because people clearly showed the will to become uh, democratic. And partly it has to do with the fact that the education system is quite good. Uh, so the elite uh, has a, a very good education and, and they maintain that level of education for uh, for some reason. And, and in, in Russia, uh, you have that in some big cities, but, but as if it's completely drowned mm. by the rest of the country. Well, I think, you know, we can talk a little bit about what's happening in, in Ukraine. Everybody is uh, uh, wondering what's, what's happening. Uh, 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 people in the beginning thought that um, two things. First of all, that it was crazy for Putin to try to invade Ukraine because they would never be able to swallow it. 
uh, uh, and still he invaded. On the other hand, people thought that if he invaded, he would probably win uh, uh, temporarily, uh, that he may be able to conquer a territory, but that the resistance would be strong and they would have to leave eventually mm -hmm. a little bit, like you know mm -hmm. what happened in Afghanistan with with uh, with the Soviets and with the Americans, uh, etc. Though of course, mm -hmm. Ukraine is not at all Afghanistan. Uh, so the fact that the Ukrainian army uh, resisted so well. Uh, the fact that they were able to chase uh, the Russians in northern Ukraine, Kiev, uh, uh, in uh, Kharkiv, in uh, Kherson, etc., uh, makes us being optimistic. Uh, uh, even though um, you know Russians still uh, have a lot of firepower on paper, they are the second biggest army in the world. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, it seems that this is the only thing. This it's the only advantage that that they have. Uh, the the organization of the army is is much less efficient, less less, less effective than than in Ukraine. People are less motivated. Mm -hmm. So so uh, um, I think you know Ukraine is winning. I think Ukraine has to win because if Ukraine does not win, that means that you know Russian imperialism will expand, mm -hmm. uh, and that means expanding to the Baltics means expanding towards Moldova. But but their ultimate goal is to destroy the European Union because the European Union is this uh, uh, um, area of prosperity, uh, democracy, uh, uh, that people who are not inside really wish to become part of. Uh, and you know, could be Europe seen as an empire, right? <laughs> uh, no, it's By the European Union. It's, it, it's it's a supranational uh, institution, mm. as you but see. They they can't really. It's it's a, it's a number of democracies trying to you know get together. But for Putin, it could be a threat of you know com for, competing. Yes, for him, it's a threat because of the attractive. Mm. It's it's like a magnet. You see, so so people. Uh, uh, who are educated outside the European Union and in Eastern Europe, Belarus, uh, Ukraine certainly, but you know Georgia, uh, even in in many parts of Russia, uh, that's this kind of life that they want. So it's it's really it's really uh, 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 what's happening in, in Ukraine is not just about Russia, Ukraine. It's really about you know it's about the international, the future of the international order. Are we going back? Uh, to an uh, international order based on imperialism and power relations, or are we going to, to move further in the direction of a rules-based international order? And I think that the European Union understands that the Ukraine, Ukrainians are fighting for all of us, right? Mm -hmm. uh, they understand that, that, but the Americans are still the ones who give the most. <laughs> uh, so. Do you think that the European Union should be doing more? or They should be doing more. They should be doing more. Uh, I think uh, uh, people understand that, uh, you know, in Finland, in Sweden, in the Baltics, in Poland, uh, 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 but, but people don't understand, you know, uh, I, I think certainly in Central Europe, uh, but not as much in Germany, France, or Italy, or Spain, uh, where there's less understanding of, of how important that is. It's also the case that Putin has for many years done uh, uh, propaganda uh, uh, or influence activities inside the European Union so that he has many allies among both the extreme right, who love him as a conservative, and the extreme left, who love him because he's against the Americans. So this is one way that he could uh, harm the EU within. And they are, there are also um, some, some talks which some people are saying that the European Union will actually be harmed by, uh, economically, right? By by the prices of electricity, by the prices of gas, uh, which are uh, having a negative impact on uh, our economies, and so so they're saying that okay, we need to you know be careful about how much we help, and maybe we need to collaborate with Russia so that we are economically strong enough to be helping Ukraine. So, what do you think about these? Well, uh, uh, so so first of all, uh, you know, trade with uh, Russia uh, has helped finance, you know, the bombing. Mm. So so every uh, every dollar that goes, you know, of, of income that goes to uh, Russia uh, helps directly uh, the bombing. That's number one. Number two, uh, when even when states uh, were still considering. 
uh, you know, an embargo on Russian energy, the Russians decided themselves to block it mm. uh, because they know uh, that by trying to, uh, 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 you know, have very high energy prices, that this might lead to uh, uh, unrest. Uh, here in Prague, there have been several demonstrations, uh, you know, against uh, in inflation, higher prices, etc. So, so uh, even if the Europeans uh, 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 would not be doing, the Russians themselves have been closing uh, the the pipelines uh, uh, because they think that they can uh, uh, bear more suffering than the Europeans. You know, the the mentality in Russia is that they suffered a lot. You know when the, the the Napoleon came, when Hitler came, and they can still suffer a lot, uh, even have a lot of uh, uh, income loss. Uh, but they think that uh, people in the West uh, uh, are kind of decadent and are not going to uh, to tolerate that. And and you know this is uh, that's what he's betting on. He wants to gain, gain time and hope that he can divide the West. Absolutely. So so I think I think. Uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know Angela Merkel. I have to say, uh, she understood because she came from East Germany. She knows what communism is like. She understands, you know, the the kind of oppressive nature of people, uh, uh, you know, working in that kind of system. Now, Russia is not communist anymore, but it's still uh, run by the secret services, etc. Very much the same mentality. Uh, uh, as there was under communism and under Tsarism, you know, there's there's yes. a big mm -hmm. continuity there. So she, she thought a big Russia, uh, uh, you cannot have peace in Europe with a big, powerful Russia. So she thought the only way to kind of uh, uh, to stop this is by having trade, uh, this notion of uh, Wandel durch Handel, change through trade. Mm -hmm. And that's not working. That's not been working. Actually, trade has been used by oligarchs, has been used by by Putin uh, uh, in really negative ways. So, so I think we're now realizing uh, this is the new world we're in, that uh, empires take advantage of the dependency of democracies on trade with them. And that's valid for Russia, that's valid for China. And so uh, the idea is that, you know, countries, democracy should be less dependent on trade, should diversify uh, uh, their trade. And certainly now that there's a war, uh, uh, I think all the sanctions uh, are completely justified and the sanctions could work better. But, but there's also propaganda about the sanctions. You know, the fact that the ruble went up very quickly uh, uh, is actually a sign that the sanctions were working. Why? Uh, uh, because because of the sanctions, Russians could not buy anything abroad, and so therefore, uh, you know, exports were higher than imports, which led to an mm. increase in the ruble, which was interpreted as sanctions not working. Actually, people who did yeah, research yeah. on this showed that uh, precisely because you know uh, people could hardly import anything from the West, uh, led to the ruble increasing, which which was then. Uh, uh, mm -hmm. uh, sign that sanctions were, were working, but sanctions don't work in six months. You know, it it, it take, takes a while. Okay, so now uh, very last question: um, What should be done uh, after the war is over? What should be done to prevent? So several things. First of all, I think Ukraine has to be helped being rebuilt. This is very important. It's been destroyed. It's infrastructure, buildings, roads, etc. Uh, and so, um, uh, money from sanctioned oligarchs, to the extent that it's legal, you know, should be used. Russia should be paying for the damage that Absolutely. it's been doing. So, so that's that's clearly number one. But I think because uh, you know Ukraine has been fighting for democracy against uh, you know imperialist aggression in in Europe uh, uh, that certainly you know democracy should help uh, Ukraine there should be a uh, a little bit like a, after World War II there should be a Marshall plan for Ukraine uh, uh, and this should also uh, help not only rebuild the infrastructure but rebuild the institutions uh, so that uh, um, so that Ukraine can have uh, exemplary institutions, you know, that are corruption free, which was not the case uh, before the war. Uh, uh, that they have, you know, well functioning institutions. Most of these institutions have been working pretty well during the war. You know, it's quite remarkable. 
that despite the 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 destruction of infrastructure they managed to get the trains working you know energy as as well as possible so so in a way uh, uh, you know the reforms that had been happening in Ukraine uh, uh, have been have been working so that's mm -hmm. on the Ukrainian side you you know the 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 new center of gravity now of of conflict has uh, gone from you know the the um, the uh, iron curtain the berlin wall to now Christ. the ukrainian border mm -hmm. because ukraine is going to be part of the european union uh, uh once that is over and so russia two things can happen uh it could um you know uh, get into a civil war uh, it could have uh, pieces breaking apart, you know, Dagestan, you know, who knows? Uh, uh, I can't predict this, but it's clear that, that uh, there's a lot of tension inside. Uh, if uh, these tensions are not strong enough, Russia will wait uh, 10, 20 years, rebuild its military resources and continue with its strategic goal, hmm. which means that in uh, 10, 20 years, it may, it may try again. And so in that sense, Merkel was right. Uh, having a powerful Russia uh, east of Europe is, is, uh, is a threat, is a threat. It's not very positive, but I think we should finish here. We've taken our time. Thank you very much for sharing your thoughts with us. It was very um, inspiring, interesting and informative. Thank you. Thank you very much.